So please join me in, in uh, welcoming Andy Yonelinas. All right, well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I think the moral of the story is just surround yourself with very smart people and you'll do well. So keep that in mind for the graduate students and postdocs out there. You don't have to be smart, but if smartness is around you, it'll kind of ooze in or it'll appear to ooze in. Um, okay, um, we've known for a long time that um, uh, our ability to remember the important events of our lives are, is critically dependent on the medial temporal lobes. Um, and my voice is coming in and out. Can you hear me? It's fine. Okay. It's odd here. Um, and of course, the, you can't start a memory talk without having this image or something like this image uh, uh, on the screen. Um, of course, this was uh, a very, the, a very influential uh, case of HM who uh, had uh, um, intractable epilepsy and, and the surgeon uh, removed uh, the hippocampus or the medial temporal lobes uh, bilaterally and this led to a dense, dense amnesia meaning that he was unable to remember the important events of his life, despite the fact that other cognitive abilities, like language and intelligence and, and uh, perception, and even some forms of memory, like short-term memory, so he could hold on to a telephone number just fine, um, those were intact, yet his ability to uh, retrieve the episodes in, in his life had, had, had disappeared, essentially. Now, um, um, uh, this has really kind of opened up the, the field of memory research and allowed us to try to kind of get into the circuitry of, of, of memory. And it led to a number of very influential uh, models of, uh, of memory. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about the systems models that were very dominant in the, the 80s and 90s, like Endel Tulving's episodic semantic distinction or, or Larry Squire's declarative, non-declarative uh, distinction. The idea being that the medial temporal lobes, these structures that were removed, unfortunately, in this patient, were critical for supporting a certain form of long-term memory, this declarative or episodic system. Okay, and that other forms of cognition and memory were supported by other cortical regions. Now, um, what have we learned since then? Um, and um, that's kind of where I want to uh, start off with. And, um, Basically, what I'm going to talk about today are kind of some of the, 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 the changes or advances that I think have been kind of important in terms of understanding the medial temporal lobes. And we'll be looking at um, uh, the, uh, the functions of different subregions within the hippocampus, and we'll be looking at, uh, more specifically at what exactly the functions are that this system or multiple systems really support. And those ideas have really changed, I think, since since the time of uh, the declarative and episodic sort of systems approaches. Now, um, the players that I'm going to be talking about uh, are illustrated on the top. Uh, primarily, uh, we're focusing a lot, of course, on the hippocampus in red um, and the surrounding uh, uh, parahippocampal gyrus, the tissue immediately surrounding the hippocampus. Uh, I'll refer to the, the pararhinal cortex as the more anterior one-third to one-half of that structure. And the parahippocampal cortex is the more uh, uh, posterior section. Now, those two um, medial temporal lobe regions are, are really uh, um, receiving a lot of visual input from the two classic visual streams, the ventral and dorsal stream. So the parahinal cortex is receiving a lot of information from the what stream. It's telling you what objects are uh, currently being perceived. Uh, the, the parahippocampal cortex, on the other hand, is receiving a lot of information from the dorsal or the, the where stream, so where in space things may occur. Okay, now that then is projected into the hippocampus. And of course, um, um, the amygdala is also playing a role, um, uh, as everyone knows, in, in, with respect to emotional responses and potentially um, uh, specifically fear responses. Okay, so these are the players that we're going to be, be looking at. And what I'm going to do today then is kind of walk through a couple of different areas of research. Um, and the first will be looking more specifically at what do we mean when we say episodic memory is impaired uh, the, uh, and, then, and looking at different types of uh, episodic memory, specifically recollection versus familiarity and, and how they play out with respect to these different substructures, which regions are important um, and which, are, which uh, types of episodic memory are disrupted in patients like patient HM. Um, and from there, um, we're going to take a little bit of a detour and, and um, 
then start to look at some um, uh, cognitive processes that at least initially were thought to be normal in these types of patients. But on further, uh, uh, more careful examination, it turns out they, they, these, these structures are also playing a role in some other cognitive abilities. Uh, and I'll talk about some visual short-term memory uh, tasks and some perceptual tasks and uh, make an argument that we should be thinking about the function of the hippocampus with respect to its ability to support high resolution binding. I'll try to unpack that idea in, in a, in a, as we go along. Um, from there, I'll move on to um, some work on emotion um, and um, basically um, make the argument that what we have to do is when we're thinking about emotional memory, we have to think about something that's fundamentally different from the type of memory we're talking about in usual lab experiments that are that's supported by the hippocampus and these, these substructures. Uh, that in fact, the amygdala may be supporting a separate type of memory or maybe a separate system all, all, uh, uh, into itself. Um, and then from there, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the effects of acute stress on these various different medial temporal lobe systems. And, and uh, at least some of the beginnings of the, uh, the studies that we're, we're conducting to try and understand how these different systems are impacted by uh, things like uh, more chronic stress or acute stressors. Okay, so now, um, so going back to patient HM, when we say patient HM is amnesic, what do we mean by that? Okay, now, um, the, uh, the, the literature on memory has been pretty clear for a long time uh, that there are, in fact, two fundamentally different forms of episodic memory. In fact, this goes back to Aristotle, um, who distinguished between um, uh, the ability to recollect, and that is to kind of re-experience specific details about a prior event, okay, uh, versus the ability to judge that an item was previously studied. It's familiar, even in the absence of recollection. So we know that these things are functionally distinct. There had been a growing literature from the electrophysiological literature for many, many years just suggesting that these things were uh, uh, physiologically di distinct forms of memory. And so you have to ask yourself what's impaired in, the patient, in patients like HM. Do they have a selective impairment in recollection? Is it involving familiarity? Is it involving both? Maybe none of them. Okay. So um, it turns out that it depends on specifically what part of this medial temporal lobe system is involved in lesion as to whether or not recollection and or familiarity will be impaired. Um, as far as I know, recollection and familiarity were never directly measured in patient uh, uh, HM, so I can't actually answer the question um, about HM, but I can tell you a lot about patients that were very much like HM with respect to the, the type of lesion that he, that he had. Um, um, but before we get there, I'm going to take a, a bit of a, a sort of methodological um, uh, uh, side, side street for a moment and talk about how we measure these things. How do you measure recollection versus familiarity? There's a large debate about it. It depends upon who you ask as to which the correct answer is. Um, Endel Talving had some very strong opinions about this. He said, let's just ask the subject to introspect and tell us, yes, you recognize that item as being in the study list, but do you remember specific details? Or do you just know it was studied without any recollection? His remember no procedure, all right? Uh, a procedure that made many of us uncomfortable because of its kind of reliance on introspection. Um, and so others had developed a more objective measures such as uh, associative versus item memory contrast. So you could say, if I want to measure recollection, I could ask you specifically, well, what was the detail about this study item that I'm interested in? Was it on the left side of the screen, the right side, or who was the speaker, when did it occur, so on and so forth. So I could objectively measure your recollective ability, or I could just measure item familiarity, have you seen this thing before, and dissociate across these different tasks. Okay. Um, there's another method um, that um, we've been using quite a bit in the lab, and if, um, uh, if you're, of course, if you ask me, I would say it's the method that everyone should be using. Um, and that's the receiver operating characteristic approach, and it's more of a sort of psychophysical approach. Um, uh, the procedure is relatively straightforward. You simply measure performance in a recognition test at different levels of response criterion or response bias, and you can do that in many ways. You can just ask subjects to rate how confident they are about their memory decisions. Um, and so what you can do then is you can plot performance, and so you plot, say, the hit rate on this axis on the left, that is the proportion of items that they correctly recognized, against their error rate or their false alarm rate, that is the, correction, the proportion of non-studied items that they incorrectly recognized. And you just do that as a function of their confidence. So the leftmost point would be the high confidence items, 
The next point would be the high confidence items plus the next most confident item, so on and so forth, in a cumulative manner. So what you can see here is performance as a function of confidence. And you can look at the shape of the receiver operating characteristic and derive parameter estimates for recollection and familiarity. Now, I'm not going to test you on this, so um, uh, you don't have to worry too much about the details. But the idea is you simply conduct a nonlinear regression, and you regress out the intercept and the, the curvilinear component, and you end up with these parameters that measure what we're claiming our recollection and familiarity. Okay? The idea, when it comes right down to it, is that when a subject recollects something about a specific event, I remember it was the first word in the list, and I made a sentence about it. Okay? They're going to be highly confident about those items. And in fact, that's what's going to drive the intercept. Okay? Whereas if they're just responding, I think I've seen that on the basis of familiarity, it'll produce a curvilinear uh, a curve. Okay? And so those are the two components we're pulling apart. Now, um, there's good reason to be very skeptical of any kind of modeling approach like this that the parameters really map onto what they, we think they're mapping onto. But, and there's a, a, a pretty immense literature at this point suggesting that, in fact, they do. So you can run any experiment you like with any population you want and across any uh, manipulation that's been done, pretty much. And what you'll find is the three different methods tell you exactly the same thing. So it just gives us a little more confidence that whatever the method is, it converges with these other approaches. So we're pretty confident in these different methods. Um, and in fact, um, we do tend to, to bias toward the receiver operating characteristic method for um, two kind of pragmatic reasons. Um, um, well, I'll just focus on one. One is that it allows you to very clearly differentiate between sensitivity, memory sensitivity, and response bias, which is a really important thing to do. Okay? It turns out that um, if you just measure overall performance, like a hit rate, single proportion correct, okay, very often you can't determine whether or not a difference you see in, say, uh, between two patient populations or a control group it is due to a difference in sensitivity or due to a difference in response criterion. Okay? Because performance can vary in terms of response criterion and the shape of the function can differ quite dramatically. And I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later on. Okay? So that's one of the reasons we like to use this method. It provides you um, um, a way of really carefully separating memory sensitivity from biases that you may not be so interested in. Okay? And that will, that will be important. Okay? But for pretty much everything I say today, it really doesn't matter which method you prefer. They all tend to lead to the same kind of conclusions in terms of brain structures and, and, and the role of these types of memory. OK, so um, those are the procedures that people have been using. Now, what about patient HM? Well, it turns out um, if you look at patients like HM who have pretty extensive medial temporal lobe damage, OK, that includes the hippocampus and the pararhinal cortex. That's that anterior cortical region um, surrounding the hippocampus. Okay, remember, it was an anterior temporal lobe resection in that patient. What you tend to find is that the patients will have severe deficits in both their ability to recollect details and their ability to make familiarity-based judgments. And this is actually a bit of a surprise to us. And admittedly, when we first went into this, we were hoping to see a nice association between a selective recollection impairment leaving familiarity intact. But that was not the case. Now, we've now seen this in many, many different types of patients. This one example is, a, 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 again, epileptic patients, but here with unilateral resections of the, of the anterior temporal lobe. Okay, it's seen with lots and lots of different types of patients. However, if you find patients with selective hippocampal lesions, okay, and, the, and we've looked at many different types of patients like this, hypoxic patients, those sudden death patients, uh, if you get them early enough, uh, will have selective um, uh, atrophy, sometimes within uh, area CA1 within the hippocampus, leaving the surrounding cortex un unaffected. What you find here are patients with these selective recollective impairments. So their familiarity-based judgments look completely normal. Okay. So selectively taking out the hippocampus selectively pulls out recollection. And in contrast, if you're lucky enough to find patients with uh, damage to the surrounding parabinal cortex that does not impinge upon the hippocampus, you get exactly the opposite. So these patients will have deficits in familiarity-based responding, yet they'll be able to tell you specific details of the recollected studied event. Okay, so you can essentially doubly dissociate these two processes with respect to these different brain structures. Okay. Admittedly, this was not something that I had expected to see when we initially went into this, but it's pretty clear now that you can doubly dissociate these, um, certainly with, with, with lesions. Okay, now, 
Lesion patients in humans can always be criticized for many different reasons, uh, hidden damage, so on and so forth, sub, uh, selecting specific type of subjects. So of course you always want to verify any of these kinds of results using some other methods. And these results have been uh, nicely replicated in both animal studies and in other in human uh, neuroimaging studies. Um, and here's um, just one set of results. This is um, um, uh, a study using uh, ROC analysis in uh, humans, and a study that uh, Howard Eichenbaum conducted looking at rats where he selectively lesioned the hippocampus. And I was very interested to see how this, this experiment turned out, of course, because he's in the position where he has much more control over exact uh, lesion location. And I remember the day that Howard sent me the, the first, um, first uh, uh, preliminary data, which turned out to be the final uh, form of this, uh, this uh, experiment. And uh, he said, I think you'll be happy to see what happens with rats with a, a selective hippocampal lesions. And I looked, pulled up the, the image, and it looked much like this. And I said, that's my data. And I s emailed him back. I said, Howard, uh, you sent me my data back to me. I'm sorry. I, I thought, you know, he's getting a little older, you know, got a little confused. <laughs> um, but in fact, it, it was the rat data. And it was exactly the same thing that we'd seen in humans. Okay? So uh, it turns out that rats with selective hippocampal lesions also can't recollect. Uh, yet their familiarity-based judgments seem to be normal. Now, if we could just get them to use a remember no judgment for task, we'd, 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 we'd sell it, but I don't think that'll ever happen. Okay. But anyway, the ROC methods are nice because you can use it in different species. You can use confidence or uh, um, our, uh, um, ROC methods in, in small children and, and, and demented patients and all sorts of uh, different groups that, are, that you probably wouldn't be tempted to use, say, subjective report procedures with. Okay. Now, um, so we've also seen this in, in lots of MRI studies. And this is just a an early review from 2007. I think there were about 20 experiments published at this point using fMRI to, to look at recollection and familiarity. And this just shows you the number of studies that show activation in these different brain regions that are s associated specifically with recollection or familiarity. And um, the main thing to look at, first of all, is um, the red bar on the left shows you the number of studies, the proportion of studies in which um, they were designed to isolate recollection that found hippocampal activation, quite a few, whereas the blue line shows the number of times the perirhinal cortex was related, to uh, was related to recollection, very few. You see exactly the opposite when you go over to familiarity. For familiarity, the, the predominant effect is that you see a perirhinal involvement in familiarity-based responding, and you don't see a hippocampal involvement. So again, a double dissociation with respect to the involvement of these two regions that are sitting right next to one another with respect to recollection and familiarity. Okay. The one interesting thing that the fMRI data showed us, which we could not have um, guessed about because of our lesion studies, was the involvement of the parahippocampal cortex. Um, we hadn't been able to find patients with that, those types of lesions, but what the imaging data suggests is that the, the parahippocampal cortex, that more posterior part of the medial temporal lobe, seems to be acting more like a recollective signal. It's more like the hippocampus than it is like the parahippocampal cortex. And at first, we sort of ignored that, but it seemed to be pretty consistently observed across, uh, across studies. And we now think that the reason the, the hippocampal cortex is involved in recollection is because it's involved in the uh, retrieval of contextual information or spatial information. And when subjects remember a specific event, they're likely retrieving that contextual information. Okay. So these are the sorts of results that have led um, many of us to kind of what I'll call a modal model. It's sort of the model that's bubbling out of a lot of labs. Um, we, we tend to refer to it as the, the BIC model, or the binding of items and context model. And the idea is, is, is pretty simple. And it basically says that what the hippocampus is there for is binding together the different bits of information that are important in making up this event. Okay? And two very important chunks of that, of, of that event are going to be the item information, the objects, the people, the things that occurred in that event that it receives from the perirhinal cortex with the contextual information that it's receiving from the perihippocampal cortex, so the where, for example, information. And the idea then is to retrieve that uh, recollected event. Um, one would need to use the hippocampus to retrieve that binding and produce the, 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 the appropriate uh, recollected information. So the idea, though, is that the perirhinal cortex, in the sense that it's, a, it's involved in identifying object information or item information, should be sufficient to make judgments about whether that item is familiar or not. Okay. 
uh, whereas the hippocampus is going to be necessary if you're going to be having a full recollected experience. Okay. So that's basically the model um, that was designed primarily to kind of account for the, the, the episodic memory results that were seen in the animal literature and the human literature and the fMRI results. Um, but what's interesting, I think, about this kind of way of thinking about uh, memory is that it's not saying that the medial temporal lobes is a memory system, per se. It's saying, look, the different components of the medial temporal lobes are doing different things. Okay, the hippocampus is binding things together, and the, the parorhinal cortex is taking care of identifying what the objects are, and the parahippocampal cortex is taking care of seeing information. Okay? There's nothing necessarily linked here to long-term memory. Now, of course, having a binding that links you know, the object to the specific location could be very useful if you're in an episodic memory test. But it should be useful in other tasks as well, as long as that type of representation could be helpful in completing the task that the experimenter gives you. Okay. So it led us to think that the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobes in this, as a system might not be a memory system per se, but that it might be supportive of any kind of cognitive task that requires these types of representations. Okay. Now, about the same time, a lot of very interesting work was coming out of the UK, um, and I want to give a little plug for, for work from Andy Lee and his colleagues. Um, and it's a, it's a, a, this paper I remember specifically coming out, and for, for years I did my best to ignore it because I could not make any sense out of it. Uh, but basically, it was a, a study of amnesia that had no memory measure at all. It was all just perception. It was this odd man out paradigm. Um, and so the idea is uh, which of these items is different and they stay on the screen for as long as you want. And uh, what they found is that uh, selective hippocampal patients, which is the group that we were most interested in, um, were unimpaired at the simple item recognition judgments or the item uh, perception judgments, but they were impaired if the task involves some kind of spatial representation like this um, 3D rendered scene at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that from from where you are, but the idea is that even in a, a perception experiment where there was no delay, without a hippocampus, you really can't do that task. Okay, it suggested that the hippocampus was playing a role potentially in perception. Okay, to, at the same time, uh, work from the Olson lab uh, had suggested that in working memory tasks, short-term memory tasks that were supposed to be preserved in hippocampal patients, that if you looked at patients with hippocampal lesions, that they, in fact, were impaired. So in this case, the subject has to remember, say, a small number of colored squares. Um, and then at time of test, they're cued and asked, was this the same color as what it was just a second ago, or two seconds ago, or four seconds ago? And what they found was that hippocampal patients were significantly impaired in this working memory task. Again, hard to make sense of, given the kind of systems approach that, that a lot of this work originated uh, uh, arguing for. However, it turns out this work is very, very controversial, and there have been many huge debates, like nasty kind of punching out debates at conferences about whether or not the hippocampus really is important for perception and working memory or not. Because some labs run very similar experiments and find that the hippocampus plays no role whatsoever, so the patients are completely normal. Okay? And this debate had been going on for a number of years. Um, and when we thought to, to uh, uh, start looking at this work more seriously, um, we, we looked at the literature and we found that there were two things that worried us about the existing literature that might be related to the mixed results. Um, and the first one was uh, um, this sort of um, methodological issue, which I suggested earlier, which is that most of these studies relied on single parameter measures of perceptual sensitivity, like percent correct, yes, no, did they get 80 percent, 90 percent, or whatnot. Now, we know from the memory literature that that's a big mistake. You should always look at the entire receiver operating characteristics so you can really pull apart sensitivity and biases. And that's almost never done, at least at this point in the literature. So that's one of our concerns. The second one was that what we found when we looked at this literature is that it seemed as if um, in many of the cases where they were impaired, the tasks required the patients to retrieve or uh, make use of very high-resolution complex bindings. Okay. And just as one illustration, um, in this uh, working memory paradigm, it's in black and white, and I apologize for that. It was actually in, in color. But they used very vivid and different types of colors throughout the experiment. Okay. And the patients were impaired. 
In contrast, in the uh, Jenison study in 2012, they used canonical colors, and they only used, I think, four or five, or five or six of them, black, white, they're not even colors, black, white, red, green, blue, maybe one other color, okay? So when the colors that the subject has to hold on to are canonical colors, and they never change across the experiment, okay, you don't seem to, seem to need the hippocampus. But when the patients are required to retrieve was it this specific color or not, then it seemed as if they were showing impairments. And now this is just looking across experiments, so we have no solid basis at this point to say that, but those are the two intuitions we had when we went into this. And those are the two questions we really tried to answer. So um, a whole series of experiments uh, were conducted. I, I'm going to talk about this one first. Um, it's a uh, it's a perception experiment. I, I kind of like the results, and it's really got the, the study that got us started. Miriam Alley uh, was a graduate student uh, at the time, and she really spearheaded all of this work. Um, so basically what she did is she wanted to look at a simplified version of the scene perception paradigm to see if the patients were really impaired. And she wanted to, first of all, get rid of the, the, the potential confound, which is that you don't want too many scenes on the screen because that might become kind of a long-term memory test and people might compare one to the other and go to the next and so on and so forth. So she just had two scenes appear on the, on the screen and they were either identical or one had been manipulated in a subtle way. So she had pinched the scene in or expanded the scene out a little bit. I don't know if you can see that on the top. Are those the same or different? Can you make those out? Maybe you're all amnestic. <laughs> I know. They're, they're, they're actually slight, slightly different. This is uh, uh, somewhat unfair um, as a subject that takes up the entire screen. Boom, these things appear, and you make these decisions. It's not easy, um, and we titrate this to be a very difficult test, but the question is, does an amnesic patient who doesn't have a hippocampus have a perceptual dif uh, a deficit on this type of a task? Now, what she did is her manipulations were not of individual features, but of the kind of the relational structure of the whole image. It was pinched in very subtly or expanded very subtly, okay? And what she did is had subjects in this case just rate the confidence of their, of their perceptual judgment. And you can see where this is going with respect to doing some ROC analysis. Uh, and she plotted performance as a function of whether uh, they were in the patient group or the controls. She actually ran hippocampal patients, medial temporal lobe patients with larger lesions and controls. Turns out the hippocampal and medial temporal lobe patients um, perform similarly, so I'm collapsing the data here. But as you can see, performance is much lower in the patient group. The red line is lower than the, than the blue line, okay? Meaning there's a sensitivity drop in amnesia, and it's not a response bias drop, okay? Now what's interesting is, if you were to have conducted an experiment where you just collected a single response, proportion correct, okay? and the subjects happened to pick a, a, a strict response criterion, say the point at the very left, you'd say they weren't impaired. The patients looked normal, okay? It's only when you include the more low confidence responses that you see that they're impaired, okay? The way we've uh, described this is um, essentially um, um, what, we've, what you find in these types of perceptual judgment tasks are two different types of responses. One we call perceiving, and those are trials where a subject looks at the two pictures and they go, oh yeah, that's definitely different. The window is angled on this one and it's not angled on that one. They can tell you qualitative information about that makes the two scenes different. Okay? They tend to be very high confident responses. On the other hand, there are many other responses where you just go, oh man, I don't know. It seems like something was different, but I can't tell you what it was. Those are what we call sensing responses. They tend to be low confident responses. And that's what it turns out patients have problems with, okay? So um, the, they have problems with sensing, in this case, the curvilinearity of function, and they don't have problems with the high confident perceiving responses. So they're as likely as you and I are to make correct judgments about, yes, that specific thing changed, and I can tell you what it was, okay? But when they're making sensing-based judgments, they're not nearly as accurate as you and I are. So even though we're, we're guessing, or we're kind of guessing, we're doing pretty well, but you don't do pretty well if you're an amnestic patient, you have a hippocampal lesion, okay? So this is a distinction which was kind of uh, surprising to us, um, but in general what we see are impairments in uh, perceiving and not, uh, in, in sensing and not perceiving responses, and these little, these are just the, the parameter estimates that come out of doing an ROC analysis. Um, and, and that will reoccur again and again as, as we'll see. 
Now, um, um, Miriam also conducted an fMRI experiment in normal control subjects. She wanted to verify that, in fact, in controls, the hippocampus was also involved in this perceptual task. And in fact, it was. Um, and this just shows you hippocampal activation as a function of confidence, and you see it ramps up. And so even in healthy subjects, it, it appears that the hippocampus is engaged when you're making these types of um, uh, perceptual judgments. Okay. And again, um, uh, it tends to kind of ramp up with, with these low-level confidence responses. So it tells us that the hippocampus is necessary for scene perception, even when there's only two scenes on the screen for a very brief time. Okay. And it tends to show up in these low confidence, what we call sensing responses, um, not in the high confidence scene changes. Okay, so that's what first kind of got us uh, moving on the perceptual kind of um, uh, uh, set of studies. Um, we then um, looked at this in using various other different um, methods. Um, one potential concern is there might be something special about scenes in the hippocampus. There are a number of theorists who have argued that the, the hippocampus is designed for spatial representations, and it should be particularly involved in those tasks, but we tend to find that it generalizes to lots and lots of different materials. Our first uh, um, uh, uh, attack at that was looking at these, these funny um, objects here, and, the and, and it's a perceptual uh, change judgment. Are they the same or different? And the changes can be either global or uh, discrete. Um, so in the global one, you probably even can't see that from out there, but the body has been slightly twisted. Um, and in the, in the discrete changes, the little leg things on the outside have been swapped out. Uh, so it's a discrete change versus this global change of the, the overall configuration. And it turns out that the patients, again, uh, are critically impaired on the, on, the, on the global change. They're not impaired at making those discrete change judgments. And again, uh, the parameter estimates tell us that they're uh, showing an impairment in these low confidence sensing responses. Okay. So we see that with um, scenes, we see that with these objects. We've then moved to um, even simpler stimuli, so visual uh, short-term memory change detection paradigms. Um, so in this specific experiment, um, subjects are looking at either a high-resolution short-term memory uh, task or a, a high-complexity task um, when we're balancing for overall difficulty in this, in this setup. Um, and in the first case, they have to remember um, these three objects. There's a one-second delay, and then they're presented with an um, a, 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 a intact or a, a, a changed uh, 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 probe trial. And in this case, I don't know if you can tell, but the, the purplish thing has changed a little bit. Okay, so you should say that's a change trial instead of the same trial. In the bottom one, it's a high complexity, meaning there's more items to hold on to, but the change is going to be more... Uh, a, a simpler change, so it's a, a, a more dramatic low resolution change. And in this case, the purple changes to a yellow. Okay, so we're trying to drive the hippocampus by either making the task, the working memory task, high resolution or high complexity, relatively one another. Um, and again, uh, basically what she finds is that hippocampal patients are impaired, and they're impaired again on both of these things. So if you make the working memory task either require high resolution or high complexity, you have a hippocampal involvement and hippocampal impairment. And again, the, the impairments tend to be in the sensing-based responses, these low confidence responses, which they don't have. They do, they can hold on to the high confidence trials uh, um, uh, uh, in a, a manner that's similar to what we see with uh, control subjects. Okay. Um, we wanted to move away from the ROCs just because sometimes it's good to use other people's inferior procedures. Um, <laughs> so we used the forced choice procedure. Um, um, and this is actually a procedure I like an awful lot. Um, what it allowed us to do was ask uh, if we looked at high precision memory in a short term memory paradigm for different types of information, we could do that at time of test by simply varying how difficult the test lure was or how different the test lure was from the target item. So for example, in the top uh, center, subjects are trying to remember the locations of three objects. Okay, they appear on the screen for a very brief uh, uh, time. And then at time of test, they're given a two alternative force choice test, uh, either for object location that's either high resolution, because the lure is very close, or it's low resolution, because the lure is moved, moved farther away. Okay. Similarly, we can test memory for color. So you get three objects, and you have to remember the precise color. Um, we can test you using a similar greenish lure or a very dissimilar red lure. 
okay? And we're looking to see if they have impairments specifically related to the, the, the precision requirement. Now, what we did in this experiment is, importantly, the high precision and low precision were, bat were matched for overall difficulty. So we increased the set size of the, of the low precision uh, task. So it's equally difficult. If we find a difference in performance, it has to do with precision, not difficulty per se. Okay. And importantly, um, what we found is that the patients were uh, completely unimpaired at the low resolution working memory discrimination. Okay. So the, uh, in location on the left, you see the, the low uh, resolution. The blue bars are the controls. The red bars are the patients. They are unimpaired. If you go to the high resolution condition for the location, they're significantly impaired. If you go to the color paradigm, there, the low resolution paradigm, they're completely unimpaired. It's only when you require high resolution binding that they become impaired. And again, we've matched for overall difficulty in these tasks. So it's not just that you make the task more difficult and they have a problem. It's, it's the precision that's particularly important here. Okay, so this um, led us to, to be very com fairly confident that there is something really fundamentally important about the precision of the representation, not just the amount of stuff you have to bind together or the difficulty of the binding. It's the getting that precise color or location information. And we're now looking at what other dimensions might also be important in, 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 in supporting these types of hippocampal responses. Okay. Now, um, along this line of um, looking at different dimensions, um, uh, Arna Ekstrom is a colleague in my department, and um, he's very interested in navigation, and he could not believe that I'd gone through my entire career without doing a single navigation study, and it was his duty, he felt, to, to make sure that I conducted one. So kicking and screaming, I said, okay, fine, we'll do it. Why, why don't we try some of this high-resolution stuff and see if it helps understand what's going on in amnesia and navigation? And one of the things that Arna had been very worried about was that if you look at the animal work on navigation, the story is very clear cut. That is, you take out the hippocampus and rats can't navigate. Right? They can't get to the, the, the water maze location they were supposed to be getting to. But humans, it's somewhat of a mixed story. Some amnesic patients have profound navigation problems, and other patients did not seem to have impairments. And sometimes they're, they're unimpaired in, in these navigation tasks. Why would that be? Well, what Arna suggested is maybe we could generalize our results from lab into this more realistic sort of situation, and maybe what's going on is that what the hippocampus is there for is not navigation in general. Maybe the cortex can get you in the general area that you want to get to, but what the hippocampus is for is for high precision memory, getting you exactly to a specific location that you need to get to. And so basically we took um, a, a, a paradigm that he'd been working with. It's basically the water maze with uh, virtual reality goggles. Um, and the patients come in and they are presented with a scene. You can see sort of in the center there's some paintings on the wall and some doors and a couple of uh, sparse um, environmental cues. And an object would then appear at some location in that room. Okay. Then we take them out of the room, sort of, um, wait a couple of minutes, put them back in the room, and then had them have them walk back to the location where that object was seen. And when they were confident they were there, they'd sort of click on this response thing. This is where that object was. Okay, so it's like the water maze. Now, basically, what we found in that study is that if you just scored this in terms of uh, very gross coordinates, like it was it in the, which of the four coordinates in the room was, was the object in, the patient, patients were completely normal. Okay? They could tell you, yeah, there was an apple sort of over here. Okay. But if we scored exactly where they were and only counted, a, like as a hit, uh, a trial which they got exactly to the right location, or within a foot, or within a yard, or within four yards, okay, that's when we saw the impairments. Okay. So what this graph off to the right shows is that um, the patient is actually significantly uh, uh, better than the controls at getting the right quadrant. This is just one patient in this initial study. In general, they're, they're just normal, but this patient did particularly well. But if you score it with using very narrow scoring windows, so you've got to get exactly to the right location, they are massively impaired. Okay? So what hippocampal damage does, it doesn't mess with your ability to navigate in the general sense of getting to the basic right location. The cortex seems to be able to do that for you. And what the hippocampus allows you to do is to get the more precise information about exactly where that object was or where you want to be. 
So we think that the, the precision idea is a pretty useful one in trying to understand the involvement of the hippocampus in many different uh, um, uh, paradigms. Um, and so um, the story then is not much different from what I proposed earlier with respect to uh, these, these three main players. Um, but basically what we're adding to this is that the hippocampus binds together the different aspects of an event, i.e. the items and the context, to form a complex high resolution representation uh, which can impact long-term memory, short-term memory, perception, maybe future thought. There's many different things that it may be uh, playing a role in. And we think this way of thinking about the hippocampal function is potentially useful in, in understanding the involvement of these medial temporal lobe regions in various other paradigms as well. Okay. Okay, so, so far I've been talking an awful lot about really boring memory materials. Okay, word lists, okay, pictures of objects or these weird colored things. Most of what we care about, though, when we think about day-to-day -day memories are the important events in our lives, the things that are emotional, okay? Does any of this tell us anything about any of the good stuff? And it's a very good question. It's not totally clear, okay? So um, we're, of course, interested in emotion because emotional memories tend to be very vivid. And if you ask most people on the street, what are the most memorable things in your life, they will list off they got married, they got dumped, whatever nasty things may have happened to them in their lives. Okay? The emotional things really stick around. And in fact, that's very well documented in the lab. Okay? So we know that emotional memories are particularly resistant to forgetting. And now that could be for various reasons. For the obvious one is that emotional items uh, can attract more attention and elaborative encoding than neutral items, which would lead to better encoding of that event and better memory for that event. Okay? So just as an example, a year from now, you'll remember nothing of what I've said. I'm pretty confident about that. Okay? But you may remember this poor fellow with a snake on his face. Okay? Although maybe in Australia, it's less of a salient thing. <laughs> But certainly in Canada, this, this freaks everybody out, okay? Um, so, but there's more to emotion than simple salience and, and significance and better encoding. Because it turns out that these emotion effects um, uh, uh, tend to emerge over time, okay? So very often what you'll find is that after studying these two pictures, if they're balanced for complexity, which these two aren't, um, um, but if I test you, say, within 20 minutes or so, you would have equally vivid memories for both of these events, and your memory would be approximately equal. Okay? However, if I test you over a delay, what we'd find is the neutral information gets lost pretty quickly, the emotional stuff sticks around. Okay? So it's not just better encoding. There's something ha that happens to these memories after the encoding event is over, over that preferentially preserves the emotional item. And what we were interested in is what was that? Okay, and how does that, how does that interplay with those medial temporal lobe systems that we've talked about so far? Okay, now, everyone is at this point obviously going, well, it's the, Andy, that's a dumb question. It's obviously the amygdala is playing a role, but exactly what is the amygdala doing? Okay, now, it turns out that there are really two ways of thinking about this in the literature. One really dominant way um, and then the not-so-dominant way that I think is actually right, okay? The dominant approach in this literature is to, to argue that uh, for something uh, that's been called the emotional consolidation model. And the idea here is that what the amygdala does is that it signals to the hippocampus that something important just happened. That was a really emotional event. Remember that thing, Andy, because you don't want that to happen again. She dumped you. Don't ever go out with anyone that looked like her ever again, okay? And so the idea is that it's, it's preferentially consolidating those emotional events. So the amygdala isn't forming the memory per se, but it's saying to the hippocampus, hey, you, remember that, okay? And, and don't forget that, that binding that you created. So whatever the hippocampus was doing, binding the, uh, the item and object stuff together, that should be benefited by emotion, okay? So it should be a very general effect on memory, okay? Um, the second interesting thing about that consolidation idea is that um, what it predicts is that if the amygdala is modulating the hippocampus to cr create the memory advantage for emotion, lesions to the amygdala should wipe out the effect, okay, or diminish it. And similarly, lesions to the hippocampus should diminish that effect because it's operating on the hippocampus, okay? So lesions to either of these important structures should be detrimental to this emotion advantage that emerges, okay? 
There's another way that we've been thinking about this, however, over the years, and that is that the, am the amygdala is actually serving as a type of secondary memory system of a sort that's specialized for emotional information. Okay? It's not just modulating what the hippocampus does. It's storing a certain type of memory representation, and that representation we think of as uh, an item emotion binding. So the idea is that what we think of when that something occurs that's very emotionally um, um, uh, salient or fearful is the amygdala is actually linking that emotional response to the physical features of that specific object, such that there's now a link, an association form between those, that stimuli and, say, a fear response. Okay? And the representation is actually supported by the amygdala itself, not by the hippocampus. So the notion is that for neutral materials, you have to rely on the hippocampus, linking item and, and contextual information. For emotional stimuli, you, of course, you can rely on the hippocampus to link that stuff. But in addition, you've got this separate system that's supporting a relationship between the item and the emotion. So if you get the two systems working, you're going to get slower forgetting, forgetting than if you have one system working. And in addition, there's some good reason to think that the hippocampus might be uh, losing information more rapidly than the amygdala. I'm not going to get into the, the neuroanatomy of that, but, but there's, some, there's some evidence that's consistent with that. Okay, so, the idea, though, is that both of these accounts can, can explain why we're so good at remembering emotional events. One is because we consolidate them particularly well. And the other is that we just have a separate system that supports memory for those, and that's going to lead to slower forgetting. Okay? So what are the results that lead us to prefer the, the emotional binding model? Um, to do that, I'm just going to walk through one illustrative study, which um, <coughs> um, is, is certainly not the best study out there, but um, it, it, it's nice in that it illustrates a couple of the characteristics that I think have been very well documented in the literature over the years. Um, and in this type of paradigm, basically, subjects come in and we show them a list of items. So they include negative, nasty images like the man with the snake. We show them neutral images. That's a mix of these things. For half of the items, they're conducting a color rating task. For half of them, they're, they're conducting a complexity rating task. Uh, that's what we're going to call our, our encoding context. So you encode it within a certain context. Okay, that'll make more sense in a second. Um, on day two, they come back in and they study a second list of neutral and negative images. Okay, and again, they do color rating for half of them and complexity rating for the other half. Okay? And then immediately after five minutes, we give them a memory test. And we're going to test memory for the items that just had occurred. Those would be the short delay items. And for items that occurred, 24 hours earlier. Those are the long delay items. Okay, so we can see, does the emotion effect emerge over time? Okay. And then we're going to test recognition memory. We'll use Endel Tulving's Remember No New Procedure. We've used various different methods over the, over the years um, uh, to measure recollection and familiarity. Okay. But we're also going to measure your ability to remember the study context. That is, did you make a color judgment task about the, the, the encoding condition or complexity judgment task? Okay. So, basically, what we see with this type of a task, if you look at overall recognition, for the five-minute delay uh, retention interval, there's no memory advantage for the emotional over the neutral. However, if you wait 24 hours, the effect emerges. Okay. So, you see a lot of forgetting for neutral items. You see very little forgetting for emotional items. Pretty standard effect that's been seen many, many times. Now, if you break it down and you look at the recognition responses, are they remember responses or familiarity-based responses, what you find is the, the effect is, is captured entirely by the remember responses. So the boost in memory you see is a difference with respect to remembered responses. So you remember the, the, the nasty images and you recollect specific details about those images. Okay, it's not familiarity-based responding. Okay. But interestingly, this is one case, that was the first case wh where um, the, uh, the, our source test or our, 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 complex, uh, um, uh, our, our second measure of recollection did something different from our first measure. In this case, what we find is that the source judgment, so making judgment about what the context was that you encoded it in, did not benefit from emotion. Okay, so what emotion does is increases your memory for the item and the emotional characteristics of that item. It does not increase memory for the context that you encoded that thing in, okay? the, the type of processing that you conducted on that item. Okay? And that has now actually been seen many, many, uh, uh, in many, many other paradigms. So 
the, the takeaway from this isn't the specific experiment, but in general, three things you almost always see now. Uh, emotion advantage in memory, uh, they're time dependent, they increase over time. Okay, lots of examples. It, when it impacts memory, it impacts recollection, not familiarity. Okay, measured lots and lots of different ways. But interestingly, it's limited to item recollection. It's the recollection of the, of the specific characteristics of the item, not to the context, like the spatial context or the processing context as in that prior experiment. Okay? So it's not a general benefit in recollective memory, as one might expect from a consolidation approach. It's really selective to item emotion links, okay? which is what the, the, the emotional binding account uh, predicted. Now, the interesting difference has to do with the neuroanatomy of these effects. That is, are the effects dependent upon the hippocampus being modulated by the amygdala, and so are both structures important? Or is it just dependent upon the amygdala, not upon the, uh, the hippocampus, as the, um, the contextual binding account would predict? Um, and in fact, um, uh, the results here are also pretty clear. I'll just quickly mention this. Um, there have been a number of studies looking at selective amygdala lesions you end up with patients that are not amnestic at all unless the information is emotional. So in this specific experiment, uh, this is recall for a story. I think uh, item number six in the story is emotional. Normal control show this nice peak at uh, position number six. Uh, patients without an amygdala show completely normal memory for most of the story, but they don't show the, the, the extra boost for the emotional item. So even uh, at least in a delay condition, um, they don't seem to show the emotional advantage. So the amygdala certainly is critical to get the emotion advantage effect. Okay, now, that doesn't differentiate amongst these two theories because they both predict the amygdala is important. The important question is about the hippocampus. Is it necessary at all for these effects? And it turns out it doesn't matter at all. Amnesic patients uh, in this specific experiment uh, had selective hippocampal lesions. Um, you can see the... Um, uh, the control patients are showing a, uh, an emotion advantage, the red bar being higher than the blue. It's a small effect, but it's, it's there. The amnesic patients show, if anything, a slightly larger emotion advantage effect. Okay, performance is down, but they're showing as, as much, uh, if not more, of an emotion effect. This has been seen in a couple of other studies. It's just um, uh, two other classic studies from uh, Larry Squire's lab. Um, they've controlled for overall uh, performance, and what you can see is that this emotion advantage doesn't depend upon the hippocampus at all. So we would suggest that it's not a modulating uh, of, the, of the hippocampus that's driving this effect. Rather, it seems to be that the amygdala is capable of supporting memory in and of itself. And when it's there, it leads to an advantage in memory. Taking the hippocampus out doesn't alter that effect whatsoever, as far as we can tell. Okay, so. The idea then is that emotional events are forgotten slowly because they're supported by both the hippocampal and the amygdala-based systems. At least that's our, the argument so far. And it's not because of a modulatory uh, consolidation process. That's our story and we're sticking with it so far. Okay. All right, so um, we're getting to somewhat more interesting uh, stimuli. We're getting to emotional materials, but um, what about really emotional materials, like, say, stressful situations, like standing up here and giving a talk to this crowd, okay? Heart starts pumping. There's more than just arousal going on, okay? There's probably, if I were to give you a saliva sample right now, my cortisol levels will be up here when they should be down here, okay? Now, what does stress do for memory? Okay, well, ask your undergraduate that you're teaching, if you're, if you're doing any teaching at all, um, if they're ever stressed during an exam situation, they'll say, yes, I'm very stressed, and I could not retrieve all the good stuff I knew was in my brain because I was so stressed. Well, they're, they're right. In fact, we know that stress during retrieval, or even prior to retrieval, is a really bad thing for memory. It's hard to get stuff out when you're under even acute uh, periods of stress. Okay? But interestingly, there are situations in which stress is actually good for memory. And you can actually use this in your lecture, in your lecture, uh, lecturing as well. It turns out that um, stress can enhance memory uh, under post-encoding stress conditions. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about stress, I'm talking about physical or mental stress. You can stress people by throwing them on planes, having them put their arms in ice for three minutes or so, um, giving them a social stressor like standing up and giving a talk in front of peers or in front of. Um, people in lab coats who are, who are rating how badly they're doing. 
Um, and um, um, what you find, rather interestingly, at least it struck me as rather interesting, was that if I stress you out um, immediately after you've encoded something, we're going to actually improve your memory for that event. Okay. So if I took all of you right now, and I had you all stick your hand in a bucket of ice water after the lecture, you'd remember more of what I said. Maybe that's a good idea. We should find some ice. Okay. I actually did this as a demo in a class. I don't recommend anyone do this. But I increased people's performance in their final test score on my signal detection theory lecture by 7%. <laughs> I mean, signal detection theory, that's something, right? But here's the reason not to do it. I don't know about this university, but pretty much everyone that takes my uh, undergraduate memory class considers themselves to be pre-med. You know, they're not all going to get there, trust me. Um, but the people that were in the control condition in, in my classroom demonstration complained to me because they didn't get to stick their hand in ice water. <laughs> and they could have gotten an extra 7% on one test question. Okay? And it got to the chancellor at some point or another, and I was like pulling my hair out. I will never do that again. Okay, so back to the main story. So, <laughs> <coughs> stress can be good in some situations. And this intrigued us, and we wanted to see, first of all, how robust was this? Is, this has been established primarily in, 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 ro in rodent studies. Um, and so can we get robust effects in humans? Um, and we really didn't know. And, and also, how, of course, does it in impact the medial temporal lobe systems that we care about? Does it impact recollection familiarity? And is it particularly robust for, say, emotional materials? And, then, and the dominant interpretation of these effects is along the lines of the, consol the emotional consolidation idea, which is that you have a stressful situation and you're saying, basically, to the hippocampus, look, really encode those things that you just recently studied because it led to this stressful situation. And I want to avoid that in the future. So you might consolidate highly emotional materials more so than neutral materials. Okay? <coughs> and of course, how does it influence recollection familiarity? And we really had no idea. So we've done a lot of studies looking at these, uh, these effects. Um, um, uh, the basic paradigm looks something like this. So subjects come in, and there's our fellow with the, the snake again. Um, they study a bunch of uh, objects in this, or, or scenes. In this case, they make complexity judgments, and there's negative and neutral items because we're interested in emotion. Uh, and then there's the stress condition, where half the group gets some type of a stressor, and the other gets a control condition. And at first, we, had, we really had to stress people. And so we thought, well, how are we going to do that? And we, we figured, well, let's throw them out of airplanes. So that's the first experiment we did. We brought them up to about 12,000 feet, and we pushed them out of an airplane. They were actually attached to a, an instructor. That was their first, first jump. And um, boy, did we get a big cortisol response. Um, these people were really stressed after jumping out of a plane. Um, I should mention they had a, t a whole of about seven minutes of instruction before they jumped out. So they were not experts by any stretch of the imagination. But we were concerned we really needed a big stressor. It turns out that was somewhat overkill. We get basically the same effect using ice water. Um, but, but skydiving is much more fun, um, and, um, but hard to control, as you might imagine, um, <coughs> in terms of timing. So there's the control condition who doesn't get the stressor at that point. They get the dive later in the day, or they get uh, ice conditions later in the day. Um, or we use the social stressor, another common method. Um, and then after some variable delay, it could be two hours or a day, or in some cases three months, we give them a recognition memory test for the, uh, the earlier studied materials. And we want to see, does stressing you out after learning something really improve memory or not? Okay? And we look at cortisol just to, to verify that we're getting a real stress response, and that's about presented here. Okay? Now, I'm not, I won't bore you with the details of lots and lots of experiments. I'll just kind of highlight three major findings uh, that we see. Uh, first of all, we do get the effect. It's a pretty robust effect. Uh, these are ROCs for stress subjects in red and the control subjects in, in black uh, for negative and neutral materials. It doesn't matter if it's emotional material or not. In this case, I think the effect was somewhat bigger for the neutral than the negative, but in general, we don't get a, a difference. It doesn't matter how emotional the, the initial study materials were. Everything gets boosted. Okay. Now, does it impact recollection or familiarity? Well, it actually depends a little bit, and this turned out to be a little more complicated than we initially thought. Um, it turns out that um, on the right, we're plotting uh, cortisol reactivity, so how much of a cortisol response you had as an individual, how stressed you were by the stressor. Okay? 
Um, and then we're going to plot familiarity or recollection on the other axis. And what we see in the bottom graph is that uh, the more stressed you are, the higher your familiarity estimates go. So familiarity tends to kind of ramp up gradually, but consistently with stress. Okay? Recollection, you see the same sort of effect, but you tend to see this inverted U shape. So a little bit of stress is good for recollection, but too much is not a good thing. You tend to really crash. Okay? So we think that in general, what's going on is that the hippocampal system, which is supporting recollection, is very fine-tuned such that a bit of stress afterwards is a good thing. Okay? But it's highly tuned in the sense that you go a little bit too far and, and the system starts um, uh, to, to, to decrease in, in, in its sense. It's, uh, efficiency. Whereas cortical systems like those supporting familiarity seem to be, we think, just shifted over further to the right. So we think that ultimately familiarity would start coming down, but you have to really stress somebody to do that. Okay. So both recollection and familiarity, we believe, are uh, impacted, um, but in slightly different ways. Um, and um, um, these effects are there for both negative and neutral materials. So it's the negative and neutral effect is somewhat surprising from the kind of consolidation approach. It led us to the first kind of inkling that there was something, something odd going on here. Um, but, but lots of experiments have, have supported these general conclusions. And now, um, here's was that turns into a very sad story, um, um, at least for my graduate student. Um, uh, I had a student who was very interested in looking at the, the involvement of the hippocampus in supporting these stress effects. And he wanted to get this in the scanner, and I said, well, this is going to be very expensive because it's a between-subject manipulation. Half the group gets stress and half doesn't get stress. You're talking about a lot of money. You've got, to make sure, you've got to show me that this paradigm is bulletproof before we're going to spend that kind of money. So he did, and he worked up this paradigm where he could show the most robust stress effect we could get, and we, okay, great, let's get in the scanner, let's do it. We run the scans, we do the experiment. He comes back to me almost in tears after the experiment's done. He said, we've tested... 80 subjects, and there's no effect at all of stress. And I went, go back and analyze that data again until you get the right response. <laughs> I had him reanalyze the data several times. He's, it's, it's just not there. Okay? And this is an effect that we've kind of replicated about 10 times. He used everything exactly the same way that we've done before, except that it was in the scanner. Okay. Hmm. And there was one odd thing about it, which was that the MR tech would not allow us to get anywhere near his $3 million machine with a bucket of ice water. So we had to take the person out of the scanner to go into a different room to stress them out. And then we put them back in the scanner to continue the experiment. Okay? So the difference was that now the stressor was not occurring in the same spatial context as the study material. Could that possibly be it? Okay, well, at first, we thought, no, that's just crazy. But we started looking around the literature at this point, and there had been more studies that had looked at this over the, over the time. No one had really coded for what the context of the stressor was. But if we looked at the method sections, we did our best to make a judgment about whether they had stressed the person out in a different or same context. And it's not a perfect correlation, but um, there's a meta-analysis presented right down here, and what it shows is the size of the memory boost across different experiments, and sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not so big. And what we found is that, in general, in the studies in which there was no change in the context between encoding and stress, there was a benefit. On average, if you look at the studies in which there was a change between encoding and test, there was a slight decrement, not significant. Okay, so the meta-analysis suggested, hmm, maybe there is something about context. Okay, um, so uh, Andrew McCullough was the, the student who was almost in tears. Um, it was one of those situations, though, that in, in hindsight, it was just one of these accidental kind of design changes that we made in the experiment that led us to the insight, which we think is fundamentally important, that this stress effect is particularly important in, in, in encoding memories that occurred in the same context as the stressor. Okay. Now, these are just post-hoc correlations at this point, so you really need to do the experiment. And another graduate student came in and said, well, let's do this as an experiment. We're just going to experimentally manipulate the context and see if it really has any, any change. Because there's lots of other things. You're in a scanner, you're really stressed, who knows what's going on. Right? A meta-analysis, who knows what's going on with the meta-analysis. It's cross experiments. So um, Matt Sazma um, uh, just recently uh, completed an experiment where he ran everyone under exactly the same paradigm. The only difference was that 
um, he had people uh, experience the stressor in a separate room. So you're all in this room, you have the study phase, and then half of you move to another room to get the ice water or warm water, the other half stays in this room, ice water, warm water. The timing is the same, the experimenters are the same, it's just the spatial context. Okay, and uh, you then come back into room A, and what we find is you get the stress advantage only in the same room group. You get the slight reversal if you change the context. So it tells us, I think, pretty conclusively that these stress benefits only influence memory for the items that are occurring in the same environment as the stressor. So stress enhances that memory for that specific contextual memory, and it doesn't generalize to any other memories, even if they occurred just before them. Okay? So it's not as if stress is just leading to some consolidation of everything that's occurred previously. Okay? It's specific to contextual information that's shared with the, with the stressor. Now, we're not exactly sure why this occurs. We're sort of playing with a couple of different ideas. But uh, at least initially what this tells us is that our, our first kind of uh, ideas about stress uh, might not be right. That is, the idea that stress facilitates the consolidation of memory doesn't really fit with the finding that the effects seem to be uh, similar for emotional and neutral materials. The, the model initially predicts it should be primarily there for emotional materials, and that's not true. And secondly, why would it be so context specific? Okay. Again, we're, we're speculating, but one possibility that we're thinking about at this point is that what we think is that stress produces a very salient episodic memory. Okay? Ow, that was awful. Okay? Such that later on, when I'm trying to remember back to that study event, it provides sort of an anchor in a sense that brings you back to that spatial context. And that allows you to remember those events more vividly or more information about those events than if you didn't have that very salient event. Okay? So the idea is that room changes uh, induce a big context change um, um, in both the stress and the control condition, essentially wiping out that stress advantage. Okay? So we're thinking of it something like this kind of uh, diagram here. So the stress serves as a kind of a memory anchor, brings you back to the spatial context of that study list, enhancing memory compared to a non-stress condition. That effect is, is eliminated if we induce a big context change in between there. So you get reminded of something, but it's the wrong context. So it doesn't help you. At least that's the way we're thinking about it. Okay. Whether that will be the ultimate answer or, um, for, to, to figure this out or not is, is, is yet to be seen. But that's the way we're thinking about it. So the idea then is a, a acute post-encoding stress can uh, can clearly enhance recollection and familiarity, although in somewhat different ways with respect to the, the nonlinear uh, effects we see in recollection, um, if it occurs in the same spatial context as the study materials. And what we think about are, are uh, kind of stress response functions that look sort of like what we see on the, on the right-hand side, where the hippocampus uh, is finely tuned, whereas the cortical regions uh, might be more, uh, might exhibit more of a flattening out of that uh, response function. Okay. So, um, so in conclusion, of trying to bring all of this um, uh, material together, um, I think we've, we've, we've learned a lot about the medial temporal lobe since those early days of HM and, and thinking about the medial temporal lobe as this memory system. Okay? Uh, certainly, we see specialization uh, within the medial temporal lobes with respect to different types of memory, recollection being hippocampally dependent, familiarity being parirhinal dependent, uh, for example. Um, and we no longer think about the medial temporal lobes as this memory system that's for episodic memory or declarative memory per se. Okay? That it supports any cognitive function that relies upon the kinds of representations that are illustrated in these, these types of models. So we think about the hippocampus as being important for this high resolution complex binding for episodic memory, short term memory perception, and maybe lots of other things that we have not yet uh, um, uh, looked at very closely. Okay? Um, the slow forgetting we see with things like emotion suggests to us that you have this parallel system within the medial temporal lobe specific for emotional item binding, the amygdala. Um, and we're beginning to understand uh, the effects of some uh, more um, uh, global emotional responses, things like stress, as they facilitate um, uh, the binding of different types of information within the medial temporal lobes. So with that, thank you very much. I am happy to take questions. Easy, easy ones, though. Only easy questions. Um.
I have the first one. I'd like to talk to your ethics committee. <laughs> <laughs> My, they seem to be much more flexible. Than I, I will say, though, the, the Human Subjects Committee at UC Davis didn't even want to see the proposal because it was non-trivial for them because it was an observational study. We weren't forcing them to jump out of a plane. We were just observing people that were already taking a skydiving class. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of our big concerns with that study. Yes. Yeah, I think they do. I think they do. Um, uh, I think that, in fact, the model that influenced both Craig and our research was the complementary learning systems model and, and a, a whole host of medial temporal lobe or hippocampal models that talk about pattern completion and pattern separation. I think once you get down to the nitty gritty and you, and you generate a model that can produce the type of output that the hippocampus produces, I think what you conclude is that what it produces is sort of qualitative information like recollection, which is really holds very precise information about the specific encoding event. It's really not kind of a dichotomous type of information. It produces vivid information that's, that's, that's I think, consistent with Craig's way of thinking about it and the way we're thinking about it, absolutely. Do you have any data that takes higher resolution patterns really than in humans? Let's say specialized or more focused to soft diet? Ah, uh, well, that's, that's a good question. We're, we're now um, looking at some uh, high res uh, imaging um, and trying to. Um, Look at the, the, the contribution of dentate gyrus in CA3 versus CA1. I don't know how familiar you are with the, 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 those results. They're a little messy right now across labs as to whether or not you can differentiate the function of, in humans. Um, we're looking to see whether we can or not to see whether it's CA1 or dentate gyrus yet, yet to see. I think probably you'd have more luck in the animal models. Um, there are some folks that have argued that it's CA1 that should produce the kind of continuous graded output that, that's continuous with, or that's consistent with the high resolution uh, output, but I'm, I'm a little agnostic at, at this point yet. I don't, I don't think the, the jury's out yet, but it's a great question. I'd love to be able to answer that in a couple of years. Or maybe you've got data that speaks to that. Maybe. I'm not going to give us secrets away. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> and that was encoding specificity. And they also looked at um, essentially recollection or recall. Recollection. Yeah. And the changing point, it was more about changing point. That's right. And yeah. That had an effect on um, recall. But yes. Also on on, that's right. And Thought, yeah. Yeah. Now, in, in um, Matt Sazma's experiment where he manipulated the context of the stressor, the, the study and test context were always identical. So that, the, the badly context was never manipulated. It was just where the stress occurs. So it is, is different. Um, 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 but I think the, the, the importance of context that comes out of thinking about Badley's work is, is the same kind of thinking that, that we're trying to use now and trying to understand these stress effects as well. Um, I will mention that there, they've done the Badley experiment with skydiving. So you learn not underwater or on land, but diving out of a plane versus not diving out of a plane. And you actually still get his beautiful crossover. Um, there's, there tends to be a little bit of a decrement for people jumping out of a plane, period. Um, but his effects de generalize to the, those paradigms as well. I wish I had invented that experiment. That was a great experiment. But skydiving is close. I should say that we were, we'd, we'd, um, we'd had this debate in the lab about how to do our first stress study. And we, uh, a lot of the animal work, they, what they'll do is they'll take a rat and they'll, they'll, they'll put it in a cage with five other aggressive male rats. And, they'll, and the, the aggressive rats will beat the crap out of the first rat for 10 minutes. And then they use that as a stress manipulation. We thought, well, we probably can't do that. 
Um, but we were having a, 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 the lab was going to a local bar uh, that was a bike ride away, and there was a, a, a skydiving school that, was, that, was, uh, that had people landing right beside where we were biking, and we thought, perfect, this is what we're going to do. And we went in, and we asked the manager, and they said, sure, bring it in, we can do these tests. <laughs> So we've never gone back. It's, it tends to be, it's hard to control. You get this subject selection artifact, which you wonder about. The people that are going to jump out of a plane, are they fundamentally different from the rest of us? Probably. Um, so we much prefer the ice water. It's a little more manageable. Yeah? Uh, I just, I'm just curious We ha we've measured many different, we, um, many different things. We have a questionnaire this long, um, the big five personality, everything we could measure. And um, we, we've not found anything very consistent. Um, and I, I don't, I'm a bit disappointed. Maybe we're not doing it right. We're not looking at the right questions. But there aren't the individual difference factors um, that are, are showing up, at least uh, uh, to us with our crude measures. The only exception to this um, is that um, whether you show a cortisol response or not, or a large one or a small one, depends a lot on what you ate yesterday. <laughs> it turns out that people who eat high-fat diets or uh, had a high-fat meal the, the night before show a huge cortisol response. And people who don't eat high-fat diets don't show much of an effect. Now, this, whether this is a lifestyle thing or what they actually ate the night before, we're trying to figure that out. Uh, but that's the closest thing to an individual difference that we've seen so far in this, in this, um, in this effect. And it, 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 it impacts the stress response, and it's a marginally significant impact, has a marginally significant impact on the memory effect. So it's, it's a little bit tentative, but that's the closest thing I could give you at this point. Um, generally, we do. I mean, the sort of the classic left hemisphere for language-based um, materials versus right hemisphere for um, more spatial materials in, gen in general. Um, um, we've looked for the amygdala left-right uh, effects uh, in the neuroimaging results. We don't get anything all that consistent. It's typically bilateral in, in, um, for us, or it will look. It will look Bigger on one in one hemisphere than the other, but we, we don't. It doesn't doesn't replicate. Um, so, but with respect to the, the um, verbal nonverbal materials, that's pretty solid. We we almost always see that. Um, but but otherwise, no major major difference. Yeah, boy, I wish I could say something intelligent about that. Um, we, we've worried a lot, awful lot about the, the role of the prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal, specifically with these, these emotion effects. Um, that's a region that will all very often show up in, in these, these memory encoding effects. Um, in our fMRI studies, uh, we very often see it, although interestingly, it tends to be particularly engaged for the positive materials, if we compare positive to neutral and neutral to, to negative. Um, it's a little more sort of comes and goes with respect to, to negative materials. And, and to be honest, most of our studies, we do focus on negative materials just because we're negative people, I guess. Um, and, and, um, and the effects tend to be somewhat, somewhat larger. But again, I, what the, I'm sure the, the orbital frontal cortex has got to be playing a role, role here. Um, and we, we need to look at that. Good question. Um, you talk a lot about the effects of emotion on flying distance and how the increased recollection or eye condition, specific eye condition, yeah. but not the source of it. That's right. 
Well, um, the, the contextual, the, the effects of, con, uh, of stress on contextual memory, as they measured by the, that, what task we're doing, are, are not well understood yet. There are no published studies looking, looking at that. That's a brilliant question. We're, we're doing some studies right now trying to answer that. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen with respect to stress and contextual memory. Um, I'm guessing it might not be there. It may be specific to the recollective response or the familiarity response, and it might not generalize to enhancing memory for the specific context, unless that context is a single context that's shared with the stressor. But then it's not clear what's being improved in that case. Um, so, but it's a good, that's another good question. And, and again, hopefully in a couple of years we'll have good answers. Any other questions, comments, that can be? Okay, well, everyone should go and put their arm in ice water now. <laughs> okay. Well, there's no ice water, but there's refreshments outside. Ah. It's on the positive side. Um, but thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I think it's amazing to think that a structure which is about four grams yeah. uh, <laughs> in size is still um, a, a, a mystery. Yes. And we've made a long way since HM, but there's still so much more to discover and uh, amazed to see the, the breadth of your work. So thank you very much. And before we clap. Okay. Oh. Same club. So please join me in thanking Andy for the wonderful Thank you. <laughs>